recently a kind viewer named Drew sent me an awesome collection of pictures of the St. Louis Exposition. And I look forward to having a look at that. And now a lot of these world's fairs seem to be confused with expositions. Very similar, at least from our perspective. Showcasing amazing machinery and architecture and engineering of giant parcels of land in a very early time period. And in this particular example, in St. Louis, we initially have a St. Louis exposition followed by a St. Louis World's Fair, an easy transition, and just the number of repurposings that these grounds and buildings undergo is enough reason to raise the eyebrow of even the most unaware. Here we can see, for example, the glorious fairgrounds and site in 1874. In the middle of the Civil War, the fairgrounds were repurposed and one of the buildings was turned into a massive hospital. Really amazing that they could build all these wonders in such a short amount of time for some of the stupidest reasons and yet have to repurpose a fair building into a hospital with the short time frame it took them to build everything in the past and there seeming to be no shortage of funding or skilled labor there should be no good excuse given to the repurposing of a building by these people and their narrative st louis exposition or st louis expo was a series of annual agricultural and technical fairs held in st louis from 1850 to 1902. In 1904, they would host the Louisiana Purchase Exposition, a major World's Fair, and after this World's Fair, they would cease to host the annual Agricultural and Technical Exposition. It seems to have been a yearly thing. They tell us this group started the Agricultural and Mechanical Association in 1855, and one year later began holding annual fairs starting in 1856. Prominent citizens founded the association, which was not intended to pay dividends. All profits were to expand and beautify the fairgrounds. And of course they're telling us right here, no construction, only expansion and beautifying. The site is a total of 50 acres. It was well outside the city limits. Of course, how convenient, during a time of horse and buggy. And it was an hour's journey from the city by horse-drawn carriage. The largest amphitheater in America was built, seating over 12,000 people. Of course, the annual fair was an immediate success and soon became noted all over the country. It must have been a lot of writing of letters. It was, in reality, a gigantic county fair. Of course it was, an hour out of the city, by horse. There were booths for vending wine, beer, and other delicacies. There were displays of livestock, poultry, vegetables, grains, and the latest inventions in farm machinery, tools, household gadgets, etc. Buildings for the fair included the amphitheater, mechanical hall, agricultural hall, the floral hall, the Gothic Fine Arts Hall, very important, and the Wire Gallinaria, a three-story chicken palace for displaying poultry. Ugh, what would a fair be without a three-story chicken display? In 1860, the grounds were made available to the public for picnics for a nominal fee, but the fairs were soon interrupted by the bothersome Civil War for a few years. In that time, the fairgrounds were used for military and training purposes. The largest amphitheater in the country was converted into one of the largest, most thoroughly ventilated hospitals in the United States, accommodating 2,500 patients. Numerous other fairground buildings of the association were taken over for officers' quarters. 
medical dispensaries, kitchens, and other military purposes. After the war, the park was returned to its former use by the association. A zoological garden was added in 1876, modeled after the finest European zoological buildings and consisting of a monkey house, bear pits, and carnivore house. These structures and facilities were eventually absorbed by the St. Louis Zoo following its establishment. The last fair was held in 1902 in preparation for the 1904 World's Fair. In 1912, the amphitheater was removed and replaced by the city's first municipal swimming pool, said to be the world's largest, of course. And all the former fair structures and zoo buildings were removed, except the bear pits. The facade of the old bear pit still guards the park's main entrance, like a medieval castle, and as a reminder of the glory days of the popular St. Louis Exposition. And if we were just to have a look at this Louisiana Purchase Exposition, informally known as the St. Louis World's Fair, we would get the feeling that they built it from scratch for this event. And really, this is just a second redesignated event. Redesignating what I called, in a past video, a beautiful neighborhood. And that's what it seemed like to me. And all these different homes in the neighborhood were given state house designations. We're told for the second go around, they spent $15 million, showcased 60 countries, and was attended by nearly 19 million people. Historians generally emphasize the prominence of themes of race and empire, and the fair's long-lasting impact on intellectuals in the fields of history, art history, architecture, and anthropology. From this point of view, the memory of the average person who attended the fair recalls a fair that primarily promoted entertainment, consumer goods, and pop culture. We have discussed in the past that these world's fairs may have been educational camps. In the case of America, this is where we probably got this introduction to the hot dog. I think that was in Coney Island. But nevertheless, this would be people's first experience of the greater realm, and not even a real experience, a false staged experience. The fair's 1,200 acres was designed by George Kessler. It was the largest fair to date. There were over 1,500 buildings connected by 75 miles of roads and walkways. It was said to be impossible to give even a hurried glance at everything in less than a week. The Palace of Agriculture alone covered 20 acres. Exhibits were staged by approximately 50 foreign nations. And let's just jump over to people on display. Following the Spanish-American War, the Peace Treaty granted the United States control over Guam, the Philippines, and Puerto Rico. Doesn't seem much like the Peace Treaty. These areas became controversially unincorporated territories of the United States, and people were brought from these territories to be on display at the 1904 fair. So you tell me what's really going on here. Uncertain about where the supposed fair goer actually came from. But here, with no shame, we're told that 1,100 Filipinos were displayed. 700 of them were used for controlling conflict among Filipinos and fair organizers. Displays included the Apache of the American Southwest and the Igorot of the Philippines, both people which were noted as being primitive. $1.1 million went into creating the Philippine Reservation at the exposition. So here we go. A little glimpse into what a reservation really may be. And let's just have a little look at some Indian girls dressed for a ball game. The U.S. government Indian exhibit. Now come on, did these girls volunteer for this stupid exhibit? 
These are supposed to be Native Americans? I don't think so. Let me know what you think. They don't look happy. Doesn't look like a good deal was cut. And no doubt even the narrative telling us this was a forced exhibit. And while we're looking at Native Americans, let's just jump down here and have a little look at good old Geronimo. Geronimo, photographed by the fair's official photographer. Now what is Geronimo doing, posing in a suit at the World's Fair? Supposed to be a great warrior. And when we look into our own worthless school history, a lot of stress put on Geronimo. And here we can see him hanging out at the World's Fair, a mere tourist attraction. Geronimo, the former war chief of the Apache, was on display in a teepee in the ethnology exhibit. And in my last screen recording that I lost, I mentioned that not only were they teaching the false histories, but also introducing foods, what we would come to understand to be American foods, were very simply introduced at these world's fairs. No cultural progression, simply introducing the waffle-style ice cream cone, the hamburger, the hot dog, peanut butter, ice cream, and cotton candy. Dr. Pepper and puffed wheat cereal were also first introduced to a national audience at the fair. So not only introducing these American foods, but also symbolizing the beginning of tooth decay, naturally creating a side industry as a byproduct. If you're struggling with tooth decay, I recommend Dr. Weston Price. And as they say, dead doctors don't lie. And let's have a look at some of these photos. Now, I don't know if I really need to stress this. I think anybody watching these videos can tell that this is not a new building. Not even slightly. And this is not a World's Fair. The German house, as depicted here. And frankly, I don't care what they say about it. This picture speaks volumes. And here, a little look at the inside the Elizabethan room in the British Pavilion. And what do we see here? The inside of an old house. Looks like the majority of goods have been pillaged. And an old floor. And even in disrepair, still exquisite. Even the impressions in the wall. Once again, this is supposed to be a temporary to be torn down fair. Why even bother with crown molding and this intricate fireplace with statues on either side? You know, I want to have a little peek at the people, especially the posing Native Americans. Then seeming upset, like they have been snatched from their home, making the best of the situation, but really not pleased. And here, this photo is labeled Giant Indians from Patagonia. It's very interesting because these days this is a subject that is left in the dark. And we've come to understand this connection. In this Congress of the Races are included a family of Tehuche Indians from Patagonia, remarkable for their powerful frames and commanding height. They are peaceful people. These Indians are said to be rapidly disappearing on the account of the inroads of civilization. So unbelievable. How tall are these people? It's hard to get a scale. And really, I don't care how tall they are. The point here is that these people were snatched up from Patagonia and brought to be displayed as zoo animals and a false indoctrination of history in the World's Fair seeming more and more sinister by the day in here. The Travelers Protective Association building. How ironic to have protection for travelers while they're snatching them up seemingly against their will. And this building, of course, is not new construction. And let's just have a quick little look at this fine book. And right from the get-go, one of my favorite buildings here in the whole exhibit. The Festival Hall 
in cascades. Very festive indeed. And there's many pictures of this. I don't know why they use this rendering. Probably because it's so unbelievable. This one site and building would not be possible by these people in this time frame on this budget. It's one building. Of course, the Louisiana Purchase Monument. A little extra time and money. Totally normal. And here we can see the massive crowd gathering at the base. Who's our little friend up there? I don't know. You can hear a little peek at this monument along this elaborate waterway, fountains, perhaps thousands of columns between all these buildings. And here we have this official photographer, William Ro not sure. Here another little angle of this building. The massiveness of this fair. Surely we would expect to see one picture of mixing concrete. Where is all this concrete coming from? It would take years, again, in just this picture, to pour all the concrete, dig out these lakes and waterways, and plumb all the fountains in, and power them. Super high-tech. And the main entrance to the Art Palace, and these guys are really busy preparing this fair, they were probably responsible for putting these benches here in this picnic table. And the Palace of Education at night. So these temporary, meant to be torn down exhibits were fully powered to the brim and the trees were already planted. Mind you, that is what I like about this fair, is it was previously the St. Louis Exposition in the 1850s, which creates a contradiction in their story. Most of this was already here for 50 years, and the buildings were built to be temporary. And I used to be an electrician, and the thought of wiring this building with a crew is absolutely overwhelming. Here we see the carnival scene on Grand Basin. Again, any one part of this fair takes the overall budget and time scale we're given. This just never ceases to amaze me. The more I look at these pictures, the clearer it is that we're just seeing a massive inheritance and designation of what was clearly an important part of the realm for an advanced past civilization. And I don't mean to be rude, but these people seem so stupid and childlike, being introduced to things like hot dogs and having nothing to do with architecture like this. And here are the Palace of Liberal Arts and the Palace of Machinery, the Palace of Electricity, and here a little look at the corner of that same building, and again the same building at night. Palace of Manufacturers, looking almost exactly the same, and the Palace of Metallurgy. We can see the people really enjoying themselves down here. Palace of Liberal Arts, with its triumphal arches all over the place, and an absolute monster titled the Palace of Transportation. Just the designation title alone seems stupid. Why must they all be palaces if we're to believe the narrative? And this baby is just a mind blow. Yet I believe this is the palace of transportation. This is some sort of airport or major transportation hub. These bays could house the greatest of modes of transportation. Some giant airships or zeppelins or something we know nothing about. And here we see the sunken garden. Some random garden. Why not? May as well complicate things. And sink the garden, so you have to excavate more dirt. Where is it all? And here, the Louisiana Purchase Monument and Palace of Varied Industries. What does varied industries mean? But random. The Palace of Random Industry. 
And here we do see quite a crowd. In fact, the largest crowd we've seen yet. Looking absolutely boring. Actually seeming like they're waiting for something. And not engaged in a fun fair. Nowhere to sit, even if they wanted to. Dressed very well. Seeming to have a better time than the indigenous people. Forced to be on display for their amusement. And this is a very odd picture. Looking towards Jerusalem. So perhaps this display back here in the background is supposed to be Jerusalem. Very interesting. And of course a palace of agriculture. Massive and actually pretty tattered. Looking a little broken up here. Windows seem busted out. And it seems like they spent their budget on the building and very little on the agriculture. This corn looking pretty sad. And actually this area, pretty run down. It looks like they didn't bother. This must have been out on the outskirts. Looking swampy and less manicured than the other buildings. Here we have the designation of the floral clock. Very interesting. I'm sure this was their doing. The only thing that's been done on this site. I'm less interested in the floral clock than this floral building behind it. And we can see here, this glass appears to be multicolored. If I'm seeing that correctly. And I think I'm just going to skip through rather quickly. Although it's very hard to do. Here's the fish building. Absolutely amazing building. Massive the fish. And similar to all these World's Fairs. So we saw this in the Rio de Janeiro Fair in Brazil. Piles of dirt or dung, concrete in the road. So these people could build these buildings to excess, temporary. And they couldn't clear the roads for the fair goers. Look at this poor man. Nobody even bothered to take these shovels out of the dirt. Truly a hazard, but these people were tough, as people were in this time period. Who needs a good road? They have these buildings. And this is something that Wood and Nichols and I were digging into some time back. And we found this image of the Chicago World's Fair, the World's Columbian Exposition. And of course, we've covered this many times before. One of the more remarkable fairs, pretty much equal to this St. Louis one we're examining today. And what we're looking at here is a reproduction of the cliff dwellings at Battle Rock Mountain, Colorado. So this is supposed to be a recreation of Native American cliff dwellings in 1893. And being from Arizona, something always seemed a little off about the cliff dwellings. When I started doing this research, I thought so even more. And what we see is they've seemingly created faux blocking to resemble a cliff dwelling. And in the new research we do, I've wondered what is really behind these. I almost feel as if these are just a ruse to keep us from perhaps entering the structures, especially in the Southwest. But this is a double mind blower, because what it looks like is they've just taken an old building and made it look like a mountain, similar to anything we'd see at an amusement park. And we can actually see traces of the old damaged building in the background here. We see columns and clearly a floor and a big mess, actually. Two by six and a bunch of dirt. And it seems to me like this building was in ruin and they just covered it with some facade. This perhaps being an example of a temporary building that they created out of plaster and having a dual purpose, serving as a narrative point as to what the Native Americans were said to be. And I'm not sure 
about the true Native American history a hundred years ago, as I'm not sure of our history referring to all people a hundred years ago. None of this makes any sense, and perhaps the most disturbing is why would they lie to us? And personally, I think if we knew our past, we wouldn't live the way we do in the present, and we wouldn't tolerate or consent to all subsequent deception. And when we accept one lie, we silently give permission for another.